I am keen to address the theme of the victim, but I am also keen to point out what is Lacan's unique contribution to this subject, which I believe is topological. The key is narcissism and the way allegiance to the big other lies at the bottom of our problems. Edmund Burglar, who coined the phrase writer's block, came up with the idea that aggression and humiliation were linked in a cycle connected to parentage, and Lacan admired his book and cited it in Seminar 14, The Logic of Fantasy. I'm going to use it to show how narcissism allows us to overlook the defects in the big other, and how our failure to signify these defects interrupts Burglar's cycle. But don't worry, I will do all this with pictures. The best part is the way that Burglar's cycle duplicates Lacan's RSI domain relations. How aggression, humiliation, and bad parenting correspond to acting out in the imaginary, suffering the consequences in the symbolic, but in the unconscious, which is also structured like a language, encountering the pre-subjective real. The only way to unravel this puzzle is through understanding its structure and topology, Lacan says in several places, and this is none other than topology. Lacanians in general can be dragged into topology only with a lot of kicking and screaming, but my thesis is that we have not used the right examples. First, most Lacanians have mischaracterized what topology actually is, so it has been impossible to use more familiar ideas, such as the unary trait and the RSI domains, as bridges to what I would call everyday topology, in the form of the effectiveness by which stories, jokes, myths, and so on acquire their popular appeal. In the Ames window illusion, there is something here that everyone can see, namely an astonishing impossibility. Of course, it's a trick made possible because our belief in perspectival reality that has us see the one edge of the window rocking back and forth, while a ruler on the window still seems to go around 360 degrees. The point is that something commonly experienced as astonishment must have a topological explanation that we can understand via this astonishment. That is to say, in terms of the way the imaginary meets up with the real and the symbolic. In the Ames window, we can abbreviate the mechanical relationship between the window as a forced perspective drawing that appears to move left and right as a 180 degree circuit and abbreviate what we know to be the case about the ruler that has a circuit of 360 degrees. We can carry this theoretical account to topology and condense this combination to be able to generalize about the structure of astonishment. This means that immersion is an actual event, an actual experience. It is something related to astonishment so that when we want to feature astonishment, we involve topology and immersion. Where is this the case? It's not in mathematics textbooks. It's in popular culture, not hidden, but everywhere. It is foundational. This is why I suggest we study ethnology, including myth, folklore, rituals, as well as modern fiction, paintings, architecture, etc., etc., to see astonishment in action and to work out how, as in the Ames window, we are humiliated by our lying eyes. I don't say do without mathematics, otherwise we would not be theorists. Topology tells us how astonishment is structured and how it works. We cannot do without immersion. It tells us how jokes work, how plots end, how paintings become more than photographs. It is about the structure of the audience experience. It's both inside and outside the work of art. It is extimacy in the service of theory. It is the source of a jouissance that is necessary to theory. What is true of the human subject is true for theory, that what is most important is not the layering of securities on top of the basics of food and shelter, as in Maslow's famous pyramid, 
but the way self-esteem lies beneath the whole system as a foreign kernel. In a sense, our theoretical, as well as our subjective sense, begins at a moment prior to securing the basics of food and shelter. It is something that runs counter to this idea of support, because it is based on our humiliation rather than our aggression. In this context of the aggression-humiliation cycle, Lacan begins to make sense, topological sense. Lacan doesn't say the subject is cut. He says that the subject is the cut. And by this, we must make sure that we understand how the mirror is a cut that produces two chiralistic, that is, left and right, faces in space. This special kind of cut, called catagraphic, cuts simultaneously to make a 360 degree and a 180 degree circuit. If an Earth Waldo wanted to make a 360 degree journey around the world, he would have to turn around to add non-orientation to make this great circle into a catagraphic cut. But this would transform the sphere into an A-sphere, which Lacan compares to the messaging in the alethosphere of language, where the end of a sentence must address the beginning and, in the process, revise it. The 360 accomplishment of completing a circuit topologically requires a 180 twist, something discovered by Pappus of Alexandria in 300 AD. How did so many Lacanians miss this? Why do they credit the Königsberg Bridge problem instead? They cannot theorize self-intersection and non-orientation by crossing bridges unless they see Pappus's theorem as bridges that are double-crossed in a space that hinges around an invisible line, the origin of the catagraphic cut and hence the mirror of the mirror stage. Let me give you a more specific insight into this important cut, which cuts two ways at the same time, creating two full circuits, one that's self-intersecting, another that's non-oriented. This allows the cut to work simultaneously in the imaginary and the real, diachronically and synchronically, on stage and backstage, so to speak. There's no way to show this in Euclidean space, which is why geometers devised what's called the fundamental polygon of projective forms. Unfortunately, some prominent Lacanians have called this a piece of paper with arrows to show how to fold it to make toruses and mobius strips. It is not. It is a 2D manifold structured by two kinds of vectors that move simultaneously from one corner to the opposite corner. The operative word is simultaneously. In the torus polygon, the starting point is repetition, which Lacan uses to characterize the demand of the subject, and the opposite corner converges on the suppression the subject needs to make to accommodate the lack of the other's demand, which is always enigmatically insufficient. The fundamental polygon tells the tale about the difference between immersion and the real of the 2D topological form. We can pinch the edges of the Mobius strip, but the fundamental polygon tells us that we are astonishingly feeling the two edges at the same time, that the difference is transferred to our fingers, which are now inverted, not the piece of paper that feels so concrete and obvious. If we rely on donuts and bagels to think about projective forms, we doom ourselves to missing the point of immersion in relation to astonishment. There's a way to get back to projective space if you can do the catagraphic cut. Knives out. As you're cutting your bagel for the cream cheese, make a 180 degree twist with a knife. You can do it. Carlos Sacant can do it for you on YouTube. The result is that the bagel is cut into two parts, each with a Mobius band face, a left and right version. With this catagraphic cut, you can get twice as much cream cheese inside, and you have restored to the immersed bagel its topological real. Just a quick story 
to tie the discourse back to self-esteem in the ultimate combination of aggression and humiliation. During the Civil War, soldiers in retreat would often run backwards so that if they were shot, they would fall dead with a bullet indicating that they were facing the enemy, not running away. Although this greatly increased their chances of being shot and killed, they did it anyway, valuing honor over life. In other words, the victim must fictionalize the act of sacrifice to provide the surplus value, the oje petita, to cover over the lack in the big other. I call this fictionalized victim the victim. For some literary background on the victim, I give you the story of the foundation of Rome, where aggression and passivity are personified by the twins Romulus and Remus, who intensify the trope into the dyad of a living twin and dead twin. Again, we can take this immersed form of the story back to its topological structure. And in fact, ethnography actually does this for us because Romulus has plowed a circle to mark out the walls of Rome and the space of this catagraphic cut is preserved in the finished version of the city in a feature called the Pomerium. This is a true topological rim, a torus that admits jouissance at specific times during the year when the city must be purged of its original sin. In true topological spirit, the goal is convergent in a way that the aim, naturally divergent, writes across as a bladder that is inflated by jouissance. Think of this materially as the need for the civic celebration of Mardi Gras, Carnival, when buildings are decorated with lights and bunting, where personal identity reverts to animal forms, and where the streets are literally swollen with parades and crowds. If I can show how the unary trait works to make a story or other work of art effective, I can also explain Lacan's topology in layman's terms. The unary trait redeems Aristotle's weakest cause, material cause, on account of passivity, which in the theme of conversion of narcissism into voluntary humiliation tells the whole story of topological immersion. I'm using Somerset Maugham's famous short story, Mr. Know-All, about an obnoxious ethnic other, generically identified as a Levantine, to fill out Burglar's cycle of aggression, humiliation, and parental trauma. The audience has been encouraged to side with the big other, the narrator, in stigmatizing Mr. Know-All as a monomaniacal bore. But we see in his aggression a final moment of self-inflicted humiliation, a sacrifice made to save the reputation of a woman he barely knows but wishes to save. This forces us into an act of our own self-humiliation, since we have to admit that we were wrong to side with the snobs against this poor Lebanese, Syrian, or Palestinian, or Jew who is so very un-British despite his passport and cultured accent. We were racist at heart, enjoying our big other. Now we were having a different kind of enjoyment, the kind that comes from learning from our mistakes, of submitting to our own form of humiliation. Just as the fundamental polygon of the Taurus has swollen to proclaim its prestige, it now must converge on a point of total defeat. It must learn to run backwards. Lacan makes it clear that the triad of synonyms, the real, structure, and topology, are the key to breaking narcissism's enchantment with the big other. But those unwilling or unable to tackle topology correctly will always be locked out of this critical component of psychoanalysis. I propose the ethnology option not just for us mathematical dunces, but as a way to show how topology has been there from the start, from the first moment the signifier became a metonymy, able to cut apart the two circuits of self-intersection and non-orientation. Theorists are used to defeat, but we look for what Iris Murdoch called the fairly honorable defeat, a defeat without narcissism, 
a humiliation that comes with honor and reward, humiliation with a smile of a Mr. Know-all.